Cooking chicken thighs can be tricky to get right, especially if you want bronze golden skin instead of burn marks. However, a simple, effective solution can take your chicken to the next level. Take a note from Asian cuisine and try pouring boiling water over chicken thighs before cooking to get that mouth-watering, crackling, crispy chicken skin. I've never had chicken like this. I don't know what the hell they're doing. I don't know. It's unlike anything I've ever even tasted. It's a well-known cooking hack that boiling meats like chicken thighs helps break down connective and fatty tissues in the meat. This is exactly what is happening on a smaller scale when you blanch your chicken with boiling water. Using boiling water in this way helps to render out excess fat, resulting in a leaner meal. As a result, you can get the perfect crisp without having to cook out that extra fatty tissue. The method is pretty simple, but it does require a little prep. If you've avoided using chicken thighs when creating delicious home-cooked meals and have instead opted for the more traditional cut of boneless chicken breasts, then prepare yourself, because this amazing technique could change the way you enjoy your chicken. When prepared, the inexpensive thigh cuts are juicy, more forgiving to cook, and have a wonderful layer of skin that can add a next-level flavor profile to your meal. To make the skin on a chicken thigh extra crispy, first, prep your chicken thighs in a kosher salt dry brine and place them in the fridge overnight. This will help to dry out the skin. For best results, lift the skin of the thigh and add some salt in between. Then, when you are ready to cook, lightly dust off the flecks of salt and place them skin side up on a baking sheet or roasting pan on a rack. With a kettle, pour boiling water over the skin in a small stream which will cause the skin to lift ever so slightly and shrink a little in size. After that, let them sit for a few minutes before draining off the water. Remove the thighs from the water and pat them with a paper towel to get rid of any excess moisture. With a bit of seasoning and pan frying, you will taste the increase of crispy skin yumminess in your results. This is the best chicken I have ever had. If you don't want to pour boiling water on your chicken thighs, you can also try other methods to get that perfect crispy skin. Celebrity cook Alton Brown recommends steaming the chicken before cooking it. While his recipe was created for chicken wings, there's no reason this method can't also work with thighs. Steaming extracts fat from meat, which is important because fat can be chewy and tough to dry out, like gristle on a steak. By steaming on medium heat for about 10 minutes, you help reduce the fat in the chicken thighs, making them easier to fry. For those in a time crunch, try mixing up some baking soda and salt for crispier chicken skin. The mixture helps dry out the outer layer of skin by containing the moisture on the meat through a process of osmosis. In addition to the prep you've put into the chicken thighs, make sure to choose the right cooking method that suits your personal tastes. If you want thighs that are juicy and tender, Try throwing them in the oven after giving them a quick sear in a cast iron skillet. Thanks to their higher fat content, there's less of a chance of chicken thighs drying out if cooked for longer than there would be for chicken breasts. Slow cooking the chicken will help break down some of that connective tissue as well, making for a more tender, fall-off-the-bone dish. However, it will not provide the crispy skin that comes from high heat. We've all been told that breakfast is the most important meal of the day, and yet most of us probably skip it far more often than we'd like to admit. Sure, fixing a balanced, nutritious breakfast is all great when you have the time, but what about all the mornings when you can hardly get your teeth brushed, much less think about cooking? Well, say goodbye to those days of running on pure coffee just to be starving by lunchtime. Give me all the bacon and eggs you have. With these hacks in your culinary toolbox, breakfast will be easier and tastier than ever. Overnight Oatmeal Save yourself some time in the morning by skipping the hassle and mess of making oatmeal. A few easy steps the night before ensures a perfect serving in the AM. Combine one-third of a cup of milk, a fourth of a cup of rolled oats, a fourth of a cup of Greek yogurt, chia seeds, ground cinnamon, and honey in a half-pint jar with a lid. Cover and shake. Remove the lid and top with your favorite fruit or berries, then recover and refrigerate overnight. By the time you get up, the oats will be perfectly softened for a delicious morning meal. Easy Freezy 
Another way to save time and enjoy warming oatmeal for breakfast is to make a batch on the weekend and divide it up into a muffin pan. Freeze the pan for a few hours, then transfer the oatmeal mounds to a resealable bag and place in the freezer until ready to use. That's not all you can freeze ahead of time, either. If you're a fan of smoothies for mornings on the run, prep all your drink ingredients ahead of time and freeze them in pouches or Ziploc bags. When you're ready to make your smoothie, just blend one of these pouches along with the liquid of your choice. Done! Finally, forget about moldy bread forever by storing your bread in the freezer. Your bread will last much longer, and you can even toast frozen slices. Waffle Iron Hash Browns Put down that skillet. There's a better way to make hash browns for breakfast, and it involves your waffle iron of all things. If you only order hash browns at diners because you think they're a hassle to make, think again. Just flop your hash mixture onto your trusty waffle iron and close the lid. The hash browns will cook to an irresistible crispiness on both sides without requiring you to do any fancy maneuvering. No flipping and no mess. Mini Muffin Frittatas Make half a dozen personal frittatas and have them ready to roll for every day of the week? Yes, please! Fortunately, it's easier than you'd think. Just grease a muffin pan and throw in chopped onions, peppers, or whatever you like, then top with eggs. Bake the frittata babies in a 350-degree oven until they're set and cooked through. Wrap them up and store in the fridge, reheating as you move through your week. Make an egg avocado. An avocado makes for great breakfast food because it's naturally full of healthy fats and nutrients. Avocado. Delicious. And eggs, well, they aren't too shabby either. So why not prepare them together to save time and to enjoy maximum morning nourishment? Cut an avocado in half and crack an egg in each cavity. Place on a heated cast iron skillet, transfer to a 425 degree oven, season the tops as desired, and bake until the whites are just set and the yolks are still runny. This energy boosting breakfast is magical. And while that oven's burning, you might as well try bacon bacon. If you're like everyone else on the planet, you probably cook your bacon on the stove. Well, give this a try. Cook that bacon in the oven. This allows you to make more, avoid shrinkage, and easily discard the excess fat drippings. Even better, the bacon cooks while you go about your morning routine. Good morning, apartment. Good morning, doorway. Morning wall. Morning ceiling. Good morning, floor. Simply put a wire rack inside a rimmed baking sheet and arrange bacon strips in a single layer. Set the oven to 450 degrees and cook about 20 minutes. Perfect Pancakes Hate those misshapen pancakes and gooey messes? Transfer your pancake batter to a squeeze bottle to squeeze out the exact amount of batter you want. Pro-level pancakes every time, guaranteed. Of course, you can also go the healthy route with fluffy two-ingredient pancakes. Using only eggs and a banana, you can whip up nutrient-packed pancakes in less than five minutes. Just mash a banana in a bowl, stir in two whisked eggs, and cook like a regular pancake. Mmm, flippin' fantastic! Round eggs If you've ever wanted to make round eggs that fit perfectly in a breakfast sandwich, try using mason jar lids. Whisk the eggs in a bowl and grease the insides of the lids with some butter or oil. Place the rings on a griddle or pan and pour the egg mixture into them almost to the top. Add cheese and an English muffin and you have yourself a stellar homemade breakfast sandwich. Easy hard-boiled eggs Another time-saving egg hack is to make hard-boiled eggs in a muffin pan. Place an egg in each muffin cavity, transfer the pan to a 325-degree oven, and bake for about half an hour. Cooking a large batch of hard-boiled eggs ahead of time is a great way to save yourself time on those hectic weekday mornings. Cereal Flip When all else fails, there's always cereal to start your day. But if you hate getting to that last bowl that's just a bunch of crumbs, then try this quick hack. Before opening new cereal, flip the bag so bigger pieces get redistributed throughout. Doing so means you get to enjoy a tasty bowl of cereal every time instead of ending with soggy cereal sand at the end of the bag. Ugh. There's no shame in baking a cake using a box cake mix. You've got practically everything you need all boxed up in a super convenient package. But let's face it, boxed cake mix tastes suspiciously like boxed cake mix. So what do you do if you crave the flavor and texture of a homemade cake but need the convenience a boxed cake mix offers? These hacks will elevate your boxed cake into the made-from-scratch flavor you crave. Dairy Delish 
Standard box cake mixes call for plain water to be mixed into the batter. But what would happen if you subbed that liquid for something that delivered a lot more flavor and richness? That's exactly what happens when you swap real milk for the water in a box cake mix. Adding the milk also increases the denseness of the cake, making it seem more like homemade. You can also substitute real butter for the oil. Melt the butter first so you can measure it correctly, and it'll mix well into your batter. The luxurious buttery flavor makes your cake taste homemade and expensive. Creamy Substitutes Mayo in cake? It's not as crazy as it sounds. Mayonnaise is made from eggs and oil, after all. Follow the directions as normal, adding a couple of tablespoons of mayo to your batter to boost the flavor, or up to one cup for an extra moist cake. Yogurt can also add some surprising zing and texture to your cake mix batter. The blog One Good Thing adds six ounces of lemon yogurt, two tablespoons of oil, and two-thirds of a cup of buttermilk to substitute the liquid portion of a cake mix. Adding a few tablespoons of sour cream to the batter improves the flavor even more. Finally, a pint of your favorite ice cream will take your cake to the next level. You're so hungry for delicious ice cream. Prepare the batter, but sub the oil and water for the ice cream that you've allowed to melt. This hack allows you to get super creative with the flavor combinations. Use soda. Want to really trick your friends and family into thinking you labored over a cake from scratch? The good news is, it's as easy as popping open a can of your favorite soda. Mix the dry cake mix ingredients together with a 12-ounce can of soda and bake as directed. That's it! The Huffington Post provides a helpful list of flavor ideas, like combining French vanilla cake mix with orange soda for a creamsicle cake, or spice cake mix and ginger ale for a ginger spice cake. Mocha Masterpiece Adding coffee to your cake mix batter is a truly fabulous hack, because it's one that people will have a hard time pinpointing. They'll just know that you've added a little something-something that gives it a real wow factor. A few tablespoons of strong brewed coffee, when added to chocolate cake, will boost the chocolatey taste of your cake without a coffee taste. Juice it up Much like real dairy improves the texture and richness of a store-bought cake mix, subbing out the liquid in your recipe with more creative items can really boost the flavor of the cake you're baking. Consider using orange juice in the batter of yellow cake or apple juice in a spice cake. I can make that with some apple juice. Coconut milk is a great sub for the liquids in a flavorful coconut cake. And chocolate milk will make a chocolate cake taste like it is fresh from the bakery. Egg Experiment Eggs do a lot for baked goods. According to celebrity chef Sarah Moulton, eggs can provide structure, leavening, richness, color, and flavor to baked products. They work in tandem with the flour and sugar in a recipe and help to set the height and structure of your baked cakes. If eggs lend all that great stuff to cake, why not try adding one more? That's exactly what they do over at Spoon University, whipping up a batch of Funfetti cupcakes with an extra egg mixed into the batter. Another excellent cake trick? Using egg whites only in your cake batter. The gang at The Rachel Ray Show advises using egg whites in your white cake mix batter to achieve a fluffier, whiter cake. Just make sure to add a little more butter or oil to make up for the fat loss from the missing yolks. Homemade Frosting No matter what you do to jazz up a boxed cake mix, there's no bigger sign that a cake is straight from the box than the unmistakable flavor of store-bought, canned frosting. Next time you're making a boxed cake mix, set a few extra minutes aside to whip up an easy, homemade cake frosting. For the simplest vanilla buttercream, all you need is butter, powdered sugar, vanilla, and milk. Candy Crush A trick that will certainly make everyone believe you made a cake from scratch is to incorporate candy into the batter. Candy makes everything taste better. Mm. Again, with this hack, there are endless flavor combinations that you can create, but there are a few guidelines to follow to make sure you achieve your desired results. If using large candy bars, be sure to chop them into bite-sized pieces. With soft or chocolate candies, freeze the candy overnight so they don't completely melt away into your baking cake. When checking the cake for doneness, don't insert a toothpick in the center of the cake as you might normally do. An oozy piece of candy could get in your way. Instead, press lightly on top of the cake with your fingertips. If it springs back easily, it's done.
Move over, microwaves! As countertop appliances go, air fryers are probably the easiest to use. After a short preheat time and a quick cook and toss, a meal can be ready in mere minutes. It's so easy, you might overlook how it could be even easier by using some air fryer hacks. The name, in fact, doesn't say it all. Air fryers are known as a healthier alternative to oil frying food while still giving a nice crispy exterior, and that makes them a go-to for cooking up frozen fries and chicken wings. These handy kitchen devices have a few more cooking methods up their sleeve than just frying. An air fryer's use of superheated air lets things cook quickly and evenly, and that makes it just as good at baking and sautéing. Vegetables can be roasted, steaks can be seared, and true believers swear by air fryer's capability to make dishes like pizza and roast beef. Even if an air fryer can't easily cook up as many portions as a conventional oven, it can make a great companion to cooking main dishes on other appliances in the kitchen, from baking croutons to toasting nuts. Microwaves have been around for so long that they're usually relied on as a solution to quickly reheating leftovers. Some foods, however, shouldn't be reheated in the microwave. Because microwaves heat the water inside of food, microwaves are often machines of extremes. They can either dry out what they cook or turn something into hot mush. That's what makes an air fryer so helpful. We won't say that air fryers can completely replace microwaves, but there are some things they can beat microwaves at every time. Pizza can be reheated with melty cheese and without drying out the crust. Leftover steamed vegetables can take on new flavors, and breaded food like fried chicken or popcorn shrimp can be recrisped with little more than a simple fry flip fry treatment. That's hardcore delicious. That's <laughs> hardcore. I mean, really. Pastries like croissants, scones, and biscuits and breads can be rendered inedible if not stored properly. We get it. Mistakes happen. But don't throw it out the next day if you've got an air fryer. Similar to how adding a glass of water to a microwave can help with reheating certain leftovers, air fryers can be just the thing baked goods need to get a second life after drying out. By adding a few tablespoons of water to an empty drip pan, any baked item in your basket will be good as new in minutes. In addition, air fryers can be effective when it comes to cooking fatty foods like bacon or hamburgers. But unless you're regularly emptying out the drip pan, you might find a lot of smoke coming out of the countertop cooker. If you find this is a common problem, try adding a tablespoon or two of water to your drip pan in order to prevent the grease from smoking. While air fryers can be just the thing to rehydrate foods, their ability to circulate heated air can make them effective dehydrators as well for vegetables, fruits, and meats. Several models come with a built-in dehydration option, but even if you don't have one with that feature, it's still possible to preserve foods. By cooking thinly sliced food in single layers, a standard air fryer set to its lowest temperature setting for 15-minute intervals can deliver dehydrated results. Just be sure to check in on your food with a couple shakes of the basket now and then. The whole process may not replace a dedicated dehydrator, but if you only plan on dehydrating food occasionally, Occasionally, an air fryer is better than buying a whole other machine. If you're the type to feel like you've got little to no time for a proper breakfast or need something to grab and go when you wake up in the morning, you'll find a friend in your air fryer. Eggs can be both hard or soft-boiled, depending on how long you cook them for, and that means breakfast can be ready before you finish getting dressed. Keep things simple by simply putting eggs in your basket, preheated to 270 degrees Fahrenheit. Soft-boiled eggs require 10 minutes, medium-boiled eggs need 12 minutes, and hard-boiled eggs come from 15 minutes. However long you plan on cooking them, be sure to peel them after they've cooled off first, and make sure you've got some salt and pepper wherever you're heading so you can season everything properly. I reserve the right to peel my hard-boiled eggs at my desk. Want to avoid your air fryer racks and drip pans from being burned by hot grease or meat juice? It seems like basic common sense, but there's something that can often go overlooked in the course of using an air fryer. Lining your drip tray or your basket with aluminum foil can help with keeping things tidy. Because the foil isn't included with your device, it won't always be recommended by manufacturers. But it works, and is especially helpful if you use your air fryer on a regular basis and want to keep things clean. In addition, if you're cooking with loose ramekins or baked shellfish dishes, using crumpled aluminum foil as a support structure can help to keep food from moving around and avoid unnecessary spillage. This can help in a pinch and tends to be quite cost-effective, helping you to avoid going out and buying air fryer-specific gadgets like cooking molds. Depending on what you cook and how much spillage occurs in the process, you should be able to reuse the aluminum foil structure you create as well. Let's say you bought an air fryer model that you like, but a part of it breaks down over time and your warranty is null and void. There's a number of things that could break, wear down, or go wrong with a machine you use often. But don't get frustrated. While it's understandable to consider replacing it or buying an entirely new model, consider contacting the manufacturer for replacement parts. Depending on the model, there may be parts for sale, or an option to have a repair person service the machine. This means one less appliance in the landfill, and the results will probably be cheaper than buying a whole new machine outright. Scrambled eggs are one of the simplest breakfast meals to make, but that doesn't mean they can't have variety. From last night's leftovers to a few splashes of vino, here are some scrambled egg hacks that offer something for everyone. 
Not sure what to do with your leftovers from last night's dinner? Well, luckily, a lot of leftovers taste amazing when added to your scrambled eggs the next morning. From day-old roasted veggies and cooked chicken to that last cup of chili, there is arguably no easier way to use up leftover food than by throwing it all into your infinitely forgiving egg scramble. Since your cooked meals have already been well-seasoned with plenty of time to meld flavors, incorporating them into eggs means you get to enjoy an insta-meal loaded with goodness and skip the hard work. If you're a fan of super soft, creamy scrambled eggs, try adding a splash of milk or heavy cream to the mix. You can also use thicker dairy options like sour cream. The more liquid you incorporate into your eggs, the softer and more moist they will be. Add milk if you want a slight upgrade and move to thicker dairy depending on how custardy you want the texture. Keep in mind that while thicker ingredients like sour cream will make the eggs richer, they will also make them slightly firmer. If you're not sure of what kind of dairy to use, experiment with different dairy add-ins and amounts. Eating creamy, scrambled eggs on the reg until you figure out the perfect formula doesn't sound like a bad way to pass time in the morning. No matter what happens, don't be afraid to make the occasional mistake. Milk was a bad choice. Light, fluffy, scrambled eggs are wonderful. We can all agree on that, right? Well, try adding sparkling wine the next time you make scrambled eggs to achieve this coveted texture. Whisk in about one quarter cup for every two eggs and you'll have yourself some impossibly delicate pillowy eggs in no time. The bonus? In addition to altering the texture of your eggs in the best way, sparkling wine lends a unique brightness that contrasts beautifully against the dish's inherent creamy richness. Maybe you made meringue and now you have leftover yolks. Maybe you froze yolks a few weeks back and you're looking for ways to use them up. Whatever the reason for your yolk surplus, rest assured, they don't have to go to waste. One option is to incorporate a few extra yolks into your scrambled eggs. Additional yolks lend the scramble a beautiful, saturated golden color. Moreover, they give the eggs fabulous depth of flavor and loads of richness. While this dish might be too decadent for every day, it does make for a great indulgent treat every now and then. It may sound a little unconventional, but if you really want to add a wonderful, unexpected flavor to your scrambled eggs, why not throw in a little OJ? We know what you're thinking. Sure, orange juice is great to drink at breakfast, but in your eggs? In a word, yes. While it may sound crazy to add any kind of juice to your egg dish, trust us on this one. A splash of OJ works like a crazy elixir, enhancing the flavor of your eggs tenfold. Orange juice brightens rich scrambled eggs without overwhelming them, so you might taste something different but without being able to put your finger on exactly why. Adding citrus to your scrambled eggs is like getting a really good facelift that no one can detect. Everyone just knows you look glorious. While most of us coat our pans with butter when we make scrambled eggs, there is a better option available, ghee or clarified butter. And ghee is ancient and goes back thousands and thousands of years and all it means is clarified butter. Since regular butter is a fat with a low smoking point, it tends to burn. As a result, your eggs retain some of that burnt flavor. No good. On the other hand, clarified butter is the milk fat from butter after the solids have been separated from the milk proteins and water. Use a tablespoon of this butter fat to cook your eggs and you can avoid any residual burning butter taste. Gee-licious. If you have ever prepared a chicken breast yourself, then you know it can be a little bit icky to handle and cook. Luckily, TikTok user Raising Crazies has swooped in to help with one of the best chicken breast hacks you didn't know you needed. Her incredibly easy trick is all about removing those tough white parts along the breast, which are tendons. All you need is an ordinary fork and a paper towel, too. That means no extra or special kitchen utensils are required. The best part is, with her technique, you can remove the entire tendon in one pass, and we like anything that's that easy. To actually use the hack, all you have to do is locate the tendon, which should have a white, ropey end dangling near the edge of the meat. Then take a fork and place it over the tendon end. The prongs of the fork should also rest along either side of the white tendon. Next, use the paper towel to grip the tendon well and simply pull it. The entire piece of tissue should slip right out of the chicken breast without too much trouble. You grab the tendon and you just push down. You can pull the whole thing out! One of the best things about this unique technique for removing the chicken breast tendon is that it keeps the breast from being torn or having to cut it apart. Removing the tendon altogether also keeps the chicken breast from being tough when you are eating it post-prep, so you get pretty chicken breasts that are also easier to chew. No wonder the video has received more than 600,000 likes and has been viewed more than 4 million times on TikTok. But the easy chicken hacks don't have to stop with removing the tendon. 
When it comes to some dishes, the way the chicken is prepared or cut is key to success and enjoyment. Chicken dishes like chicken fajitas and stir fries require careful preparation. For these meals to come together, chicken is usually cut into very thin strips, but as anyone who has attempted this knows, the task can prove quite difficult. One way to get the strips super thin is to freeze the chicken slightly before cutting it. This will make the chicken firmer, which also makes it easier to cut into such thin strips. Another one of our favorite hacks is for turning wings into boneless wings with ease. The key to pulling this off is to find the small bone in the wing first. Once you have the end of it and can wiggle it out, do the same with the large bone. It might take some twisting and pulling to get them both out, but the extra effort will pay off when you are eating easy, boneless wings. Whether you cut a whole chicken yourself or choose to buy it prepared, there are tons of other useful hacks for cooking and preparing chicken. One that we particularly love is using a hand mixer to shred cooked chicken. It makes the chores so much faster and easier than shredding chicken by hand. Employing a few tips while seasoning can help make chicken all the better, too. Ingredients like salt help keep chicken moist while it's cooking, but yogurt tenderizes the meat, too. Throw in your favorite herbs and your chicken will be good to go. Poaching your chicken in milk is another way to make it incredibly tender. There are certainly ways to spruce up roasted chicken, too. For beautifully golden and crisp skin, slather the chicken in mayo before putting it in the oven. A whole chicken will also cook a lot faster if you remove the backbone and lay the chicken flat on a rack. No matter what kind of chicken you prefer or how you enjoy cooking it most, there are tons of shortcuts to explore and road test in your own kitchen. Whether it is a why didn't I think of that hack or a new method for tenderizing or keeping moisture in the meat, it's worth giving it a try. Who knows, your chicken game may be forever changed. Nothing ruins a snacking session quite like opening a bag of potato chips and finding out they've gone stale because you failed to seal them properly. Make no mistake, air is the enemy of your chips, and without a strong defense, those delicious chips have no hope of staying fresh. Sure, you could avoid this problem by eating a whole bag in one sitting, but unless you're trying to hit a new high score with your cholesterol, we don't recommend that. But there's a simple solution to keep your chips fresh and crispy, and it doesn't require a chip clip or rubber band or any other device to keep out the air. Top Chef host Padma Lakshmi recently posted to Twitter a video of this chip-saving technique with the caption, How am I just finding out about this now? We don't know, Padma, but your chip snacking is surely better because of it. The secret? A fold and roll technique that really does work. Lakshmi isn't folding the chip egg in the video, but TikTok user Heidi Tully, who told Today that she was shown the technique by a high school classmate while riding the bus to a sporting event. Tully said, I've been folding my bags of chips this way ever since, and it blows people's minds every time. The videos racked up over 10 million views. The food hack is so simple that Tully demonstrates it in less than 15 seconds. Get all the air out of the bag and fold both corners to the center to make a triangular shape. Roll the bottom of the fold up and fold the top over to tuck it inside the pocket you've made. A tight seal locks the air out, and you can even flip the bag over and the chips will stay inside. If the chips have fallen out of the bag, it's a clear sign that you need to finesse your technique. And in that case, you'll need to start over again. Hey guys, look what I smuggled aboard! Homer, no! Huh? They'll clog the instruments! Careful, they're ruffled! I'll take care of this. There's also variations on this folding method that will guarantee a crisp bag of chips. The inverted roll technique, for example. This method resembles the first steps of Tully's, but instead of rolling the bag seal from the bottom up, it requires that you roll from the top down, making it easier for the novice chip sealer. Push all the air out of the bag, fold from the top to where the chips are inside the bag, then fold the right and left corners of the bag towards the middle, allowing the corners to meet at the center, and fold the top of the bag down. Keep folding down until you reach the chips. Insert your thumbs under the flaps made and invert the flaps over the top edge to perfectly seal your chips. Voila! 
A demonstration by Steve's Real World features a similar method, except after folding the corners to the middle of the bag, you roll the top of the bag backward, and then fold the resulting flaps over the corners. And if you crave yet another tight seal technique that can make any chip fanatic proud, here's something special for you. This nifty technique is demonstrated by Outlaw 8117. You'll grab the top corners and roll the bag snugly down several times. Fold these corners forward and tuck them underneath the roll you made. Then tuck the whole fold back in on itself, using your thumbs to push the backs of the folded corners inward as you fold backward. While sealing chips the right way can be a little challenging, these techniques can be mastered in just a few minutes and will give your bag of chips the fresh longevity they deserve. Ask somebody if they want some chips and fresh guacamole and they're bound to reply with an enthusiastic yes. But ask them if they'd like some chips and two-day-old guacamole and they'll probably stand up to leave. What? I am done! I don't deserve this! I really do not deserve this! This is because, as any fan of guac will tell you, it doesn't keep well, and it's always best enjoyed fresh. Assuming you're one of those folks who has the willpower to not consume an entire bowl of guacamole in a single sitting, you probably know what happens when you try to store it in the fridge. After just a couple of hours, that once vibrant and green guacamole is now a putrid grayish brown. And you, you have fear. You have fear of the browning of the guacamole. But there's actually a way to keep your guacamole fresh, and it's likely not how you've been storing it all these years. You can't beat the enemy if you don't know the enemy's weakness, and to properly store guacamole, you must know what the enemy is. Oxygen. Guacamole and avocados in general don't hold up well once exposed to oxygen. According to compound interest, this exposure results in a rapid browning of the fruit's melanin pigments. The same thing happens to other fruits like bananas, and despite what you may have heard, leaving the pit in the avocado or guac has zero effect on slowing down the browning process. Now that everyone understands that oxygen is the enemy of the avocado, let's see how you can better protect those sensitive compounds and enzymes in your guac. It's a crime against food to let a bowl of guacamole go to waste by tossing it in the trash. But it's also understandable that brown guacamole is less than appetizing. So what's a guacamole lover to do? Fear not, because there is a solution and it doesn't involve lime juice, plastic wrap, or ancient Aztec spells. According to The Kitchen, the easiest solution is simply adding a little bit of H2O. You can use this trick either with the bowl that you've been eating your guacamole out of or by transferring it to a plastic container. Simply pour a small amount of water on the surface of the guacamole, around a half inch or so. Make sure it's covered up tightly and your guacamole should stay fresh. And most importantly, green in the refrigerator for two or three days. Adding water to your guacamole might seem like a gross idea, but have faith. You're going to want to try this out next time you have some leftovers. Notice that no one's telling you you're supposed to mix in the water, only pour it on top. This is because the guacamole itself is so thick that the water won't seep down into it. You'll want to make sure to press out any air bubbles and pack it into the bowl before adding the water. The water will act as a barrier that prevents the oxygen from getting into the guacamole and browning its melanin pigments. After you've poured the water on, just put an airtight lid on it and then place it in the fridge. When you're ready to bust it out for Taco Tuesday or another round of tortilla chips, just pour out the water that's resting on the guacamole surface and stir it up a little before serving. This is some kick-ass guacky whip that man. While we're on the subject of preventing guacamole browning and keeping it as green and fresh as possible, it does raise an interesting question. Aside from why a person would want to eat brown guacamole, is it even safe to do so? According to Business Insider, it is. The browning of the guacamole is simply the avocado's compounds reacting to air exposure, and this can happen in just a few hours. It takes significantly longer for the guacamole to actually spoil. The texture may be a little different, but who knows, maybe you'll dig it. If it really bugs you, then you can simply scrape off the layer of brown guacamole, and you should find the guacamole at the bottom of the bowl relatively green. Then again, you could just use the amazing water food hack you just learned and avoid that brown guacamole altogether. Hey, I never asked you. Yeah. You like guacamole? Ah! Most people start eating grilled cheese sandwiches as kids and never really stop. While memories of the sandwich probably recall thickly buttered bread and your trusty skillet, it turns out you should actually be using your air fryer. It may sound like blasphemy to grilled cheese traditionalists, but hear us out. Have you ever tried making grilled cheese only to have the bread turn soft, oily, and totally not crispy? 
Or have you ever started toasting your sandwich in the skillet, only to have it somehow burn before the cheese inside is melted? That might be the butter's fault. The sizzling milk fat and butter is what fries your bread to a crisp, but things can go wrong if the temperature is too low. And if the temperature is too high, the butter can burn. If you don't use enough butter, your sandwich might not get crisp. And if you use too much, it could taste oily, according to Bon Appetit. Who knew there were so many potentially bad outcomes to a basic grilled cheese? Dad? Yeah? Well, wait till this is cold and the cheese isn't hardly melted down. Thus, you should look to your air fryer. Air fryers cook your food by whipping super hot air around your ingredients at high speeds. You only need a tiny bit of butter to crisp up your bread when you use the air fryer. And since your bread isn't sitting directly in the puddle of butter in the air fryer's basket like it would be in a skillet, the whole sandwich cooks more evenly via new air. You get the delicious butter flavor without all the culinary drama. No soggy beige bread, no random burn spots. By the time the cheese is gooey and melted, the bread is evenly golden brown and perfectly crisp. Making air fryer grilled cheese is simple. Preheat your air fryer and sparingly butter one side each of two slices of bread. Put a slice or two of your favorite cheese between them, then place the sandwich in your air fryer. Cook for about 10 minutes until golden and crispy outside, flipping once after the first seven, via my recipes. But Vegetarian Mama reminds you to make sure not to use too much butter, or things could get smoky. But if you don't have access to an air fryer, there are a few things you can do to turn out a better-than-decent grilled cheese sandwich with the basics like a toaster. Bustle recommends you toast both sides of the bread you intend to grill, or throw it into the panini maker to give your sandwich more of a snap. Another top tip for a grilled cheese sandwich you'd stake your reputation on involves shredding the cheese you plan to use, especially if it comes in a block, because shredding gives your cheese the chance to melt more quickly and evenly. While you might be tempted to stuff your sandwich with an old cheese friend, like a good old craft single, there's no reason why you can't tap the cheesemonger for his thoughts on other cheeses that you might add to create your own multi-cheese blend. If you're really feeling adventurous, adding slices of fresh fruit like apples and avocados or veggies like broccoli and spinach will go a long way in turning this childhood classic into an instant adult favorite. If you've got some grated Parmesan to add to the sandwich, you might consider adding it to the outside to give it a bit of a crunch. To do this, brush melted butter on the outside surfaces of your sandwich, sprinkle on the Parmesan, then toss down a slice of bread onto the pan, cheese side down. According to Brit Plus Co., you can build your grilled cheese sandwich and cover the fillings with a second slice of bread that's been coated with butter and Parmesan. Flip when the bottom has been cooked and crisped. Eat this, not that explains that the best part about adding Parmesan on the outside is that you get to enjoy an additional bite of cheese, but you also avoid loading your sandwich down with filling, which could keep the cheese from cooking through. There are hidden treasures that no one talks about, but Costco most certainly isn't one of them. The members-only wholesale retail juggernaut carries items that have actual cult followings, and Costco fans are often freaking out about new products in the Costco-centric corners of social media. Oh, I love this place. I'd love to get lost in here. Wouldn't it be something? And all of that's before the fresh-cooked food even comes into play. Fast food chains are often simple enough to condense into one key product, like McDonald's Big Mac or Burger King's Whopper. This is usually far more difficult with big box retail stores, which carry thousands upon thousands of products and serve customers from all walks of life with radically differing tastes. Not so with Costco. Their unbelievably delicious $4.99 rotisserie chicken is the stuff of legends. And as Winsight Grocery Business notes, the company sold an astounding 101 million of these tasty poultry treats in 2020 alone. Seeing as Costco has clearly optimized their signature chicken dish in every possible way, it's almost impossible to imagine how one could improve it. Well, the chicken itself is tasty as it is, but you can always optimize your ability to get it from the spit to your plate as quickly as possible. Let's take a look at the handy hack that allows you to cut your Costco chicken quickly. Any devoted fan of chicken dishes is probably familiar with the wishbone, the Y-shaped thing where the neck turns to breast. It's famously handy for making wishes, especially if one of your wishes happens to be the ability to carve a Costco rotisserie chicken as quickly as possible. The trick to cutting Costco rotisserie chicken, or any rotisserie chicken really, comes courtesy of comfort food specialist Rachel Ray. Her Rachel Ray magazine has posted a handy hack for turning the rotisserie chicken from a complete bird to a plate full of deliciousness in no time. The trick here is simply to locate the wishbone, use a knife to make a tiny cut behind it, and remove it. So why should you take the extra step to manhandle a perfectly good wishbone? Turns out, it's the only thing that prevents you from removing the entirety of the breast meat in one succulent piece. Once the wishbone is out, 
You can stick your finger under the breast meat and remove the entire breast in one chunk, according to the magazine. Crush some garlic, some fresh mint, that's rotisserie heaven. Now, let's say you want to carve your delicious Costco rotisserie chicken at the dinner table. And feel that unexpected rummaging around the bird's innards to remove a tiny bone might cause comment. In that case, you might feel inclined to use the classic guide to carving chicken, which might cause slightly more waste, but still does the job. Cut it and carve it like you would your Thanksgiving turkey. It all starts with pulling the leg and making a cut between it and the rest of the bird. After that, pull the two apart enough to make another cut that separates them. Then, after the legs are done, remove the breast separately by cutting along the breastbone. This is where the wishbone trick would help. Costco rotisserie chicken is delicious, and with its cheap price and sheer tastiness, no one's going to blame you if you want to feast on the stuff by eating it with your bare hands as soon as you can rip that plastic shell off. However, when push comes to shove, it's always worth having a couple of handy carving tips in your back pocket, since the technique is basically the same for everything from rotisserie chicken to turkey. Rude, I'm trying to get an angle. So would you spot weld this, Mom? For the uninitiated, stripping a Costco rotisserie chicken from the whole thing to piles of delicious, ready-to-eat meat can seem super difficult. But if you take a moment to learn the basics, you'll figure it out in no time. And if you go just a little bit beyond by removing the wishbone, what once seemed like an arduous task soon turns out to be a shockingly simple one. And that's not just wishful thinking. Sometimes the simplest techniques can make the biggest difference in your meals. And nothing could be more simple than pouring a little boiling water over your pork. When it comes to roast pork, achieving the perfect crackling can elevate your dish from good to exceptional. While there are various methods to achieve crispy crackling, pouring boiling water over the pork before roasting is a technique that promises outstanding results. The key to achieving crackling that is both crispy and tender lies in removing moisture from the pork skin during the cooking process. Pouring boiling water over the pork before roasting jumpstarts this evaporation process. The scalding water helps to open up the skin's pores, allowing excess moisture to escape more easily during cooking. Score the skin in 1 cm intervals with a sharp knife to help distribute the heat and render the fat effectively. As the pork roasts, the slits that the boiling water has helped to open will aid in breaking down and releasing the fat underneath the skin, creating a perfect balance between a crispy exterior and succulent meat. Not only does pouring boiling water over the pork contribute to achieving excellent crackling, but it also enhances the overall flavor and texture of the dish. This method helps to tighten the skin and render the fat, leading to a rich and melt-in-your-mouth experience. In order to achieve a delectable crisp, you need two things, a tight, dry skin and a good layer of fat under it. The process of pouring boiling water over the pork is similar to that used in the Chinese process of roasting ducks and is called for in any recipe for Peking duck. The boiling water tightens the skin of the duck, and then the bird is hung to dry completely before the cooking begins. It's a beautiful duck, yes, it, it, it really is. It Similarly, after you pour the boiling water over your pork, you'll need to be sure the skin is thoroughly dry before you move on to the next step. You can pat it dry with towels and then leave it in the fridge for a day or two. During this time, the work that the boiling water began, removing the moisture and oil from the skin, will be completed, and you'll wind up with a perfectly taut skin. At this point, the cuts you made into the skin and fat before you added the boiling water will be pulled wide open, and this is where the real magic happens. If you rub the meat with oil, salt, and your choice of seasoning, the paper-dry skin will readily absorb the oil. Be sure to get the salt and oil mixture deep into those open cuts. The salt will penetrate beneath the skin to remove any excess moisture and will break down the proteins, which will help to tenderize the meat while adding a savory flavor to the soon-to-be crispy skin. Another advantage of pouring boiling water over pork for perfect crackling is the time and cost efficiency it offers. Unlike other techniques that may require additional steps or specialized equipment, this this method is relatively simple and accessible to home cooks. It saves time by combining the process of boiling water with the initial preparation of the pork, allowing you to achieve optimal crackling with maximum efficiency. Whether you're planning a succulent pork roast or a flavorful pork belly dish, pouring boiling water over the pork is a versatile technique that can be adapted to various cuts and recipes. The method of using boiling water provides consistent and reliable results, ensuring that your crackling is a standout feature of the meal. Aesthetics also play a significant role in the enjoyment of food, and pouring boiling water over the pork can enhance the look of the finished item. 
the hot water treatment helps to create a clean and smooth surface on the pork skin, resulting in an attractive golden brown and blistered crackling. The visual impact of beautifully crackled pork can make your dish more appealing to your guests. Social media site TikTok is at it again, this time offering a totally genius hack to switch up the way we make tacos. Pizza? Now that's what I call a taco. Well, it's not a taco town taco until we roll it up in a blueberry pancake. In this video posted by TikTok user Clean Air, you see a Mission Street taco flour tortilla as it's being placed into a toaster. As the tortilla heats, it puffs up to resemble a pita. Clean Air then cuts a slit into the top of the tortilla and fills it with some delicious taco ingredients. It's so simple, so genius, and such a snack time game changer. Let it suffice to say, people are really digging this new tortilla toaster hack. In fact, the short video has already earned over 180,000 views and almost 2,000 comments. There have been a few criticisms, however. For instance, some cranky commenters claim the recipe isn't new at all and think that it's essentially a gordita. Delish tried out this viral taco hack and had a few words of advice. Evidently, you need to use a smaller, street taco-sized tortilla in order for this method to work. Also, be sure to turn your toaster down to a low setting. It doesn't take long for the tortilla to be burned to a crisp if you aren't paying attention. Let's hope this TikTok tortilla hack ends up performing better than previous ones. Anyone remember that toaster quesadilla hack that went viral back in May 2020? It ended up causing quite a bit of controversy. While outlets like The Kitchen praised the time-saving toaster cooking method, others were a bit more skeptical. According to Better Homes and Gardens, cooking melty things like cheese in a toaster increases your chances of starting a fire. The publication strongly advises that you skip this trick and just use your stove, panini maker, or microwave instead. Anyway, this new tortilla toaster hack seems to be perfectly safe, so long as you follow the instructions and don't feel your tortilla while it's inside the toaster. Keep that in mind and you should be in for quite a treat. Okay, but what if you want a tortilla hack that can simplify your breakfast routine? Not to worry, just take a look at this viral TikTok video which takes on the ever-popular breakfast burrito. Using the method demonstrated here, you only use one pan to make your burrito, sealing the ingredients together so there's less to clean up. The fun begins when you pour some scrambled eggs into a pan. Once the eggs start to set, place a tortilla on top and flip the whole thing. The eggs will adhere to the inside of the burrito. After flipping, add your favorite fillings and roll the whole thing up. This gives the food some additional time in the pan, allowing the tortilla to brown and the cheese to fully melt. The video was also a smashing success, and other TikTok users were quick to suggest ways to customize the recipe and make it your own. For example, you could swap out the bacon for breakfast sausage, spice it up with hot sauce or salsa, or add some extra cheese in case you really want to seal up all this goodness nice and tight. We'll leave you with one other terrific cooking hack in case you want to make your own authentic gorditas at home. Isabel Eats offers a super simple recipe that features homemade corn tortillas. According to the website, gorditas are really quite customizable at the end of the day. They can even be made gluten-free, vegan, or vegetarian with very little effort on your part. To make gorditas at home, take your tortilla dough with corn flour and grill or fry it to create a thick tortilla pocket. When the tortillas are crispy and browned on both sides, move them to cool under a dish towel if grilled, or put them on a layer of paper towels if fried. Once the tortilla pockets are cool enough to handle, split the tops and start stuffing. According to Isabel Eats, common gordita fillings include refried beans, chili verde, chorizo and eggs. She even suggests using leftovers from the fridge to stuff your gorditas, making this an even easier and faster dish than before. Oh yeah, we're definitely giving this a try at our earliest convenience. A fish-infused ingredient, a popular canned fruit, and spicy hot sauces? Get ready to up your sausage gravy game with these additions. A velvety sauce starts with the roux. A roux is a fundamental technique in cooking that uses equal parts fat and flour to thicken sauces and gravies. To make a roux for gravies, you will start by heating fat in a skillet. Since pork often leaves rendered fat after cooking, you can use some of that fat to create your base. But as you will want at least two tablespoons of fat, you may want to compensate with butter. You can never have too much butter. The fat content of real butter is best for a roux, and we do recommend using butter instead of margarine. You can use salted or unsalted butter without affecting the final result. Unsalted butter is preferred by many cooks as it allows salt levels to be adjusted more easily when cooking. Margarine can work in a pinch, though it is made of vegetable oil instead of cream, has higher water content, and sometimes added components that can affect the final taste and texture of the gravy.
Once the roux is golden in color and frothy, it's time to make things nice and creamy. Adding milk creates a classic bechamel sauce, which is one of the five French mother sauces. In most cases, whole milk is widely preferred when making bechamel. Whole milk has a fat content of 3.25% per The Washington Post, and this fat content is what creates a thick, rich sauce for sausage gravy. If you substitute with skim milk, you could end up with a finished product watery in composition. As for a plant-based milk alternative, you may end up with the same consistency problems as well as an undesired, naturally sweet taste that's often found in nut and oat beverages. Full-fat dairy has unfairly gotten a poor reputation in the past. However, a recent study published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition suggests that full-fat dairy may have protective benefits against certain conditions, when consumed in moderation, of course. Create a rich and silky dish using whole milk and rest easy knowing you're getting loads of flavor with potential health benefits. Certain spices, like ground sage, offer up amazing flavors to enhance a basic blonde breakfast sausage. Sage provides an earthy, woodsy taste that goes perfectly with pork. According to Spiceography, the citrus and pine notes found in sage can cut the richness of a dish and accentuate the minerality of certain ingredients. Ground sage is a powder made from finely ground dried sage leaves, and it has a more pungent flavor than fresh sage. If you're using either ground sage or dried sage leaves, add them early on in the cooking process to allow the flavor to soften before serving. You could also use fresh sage, but since they have a more mild taste, it is best to add fresh sage near the end of the cooking process or as a finishing garnish. Thyme is another savory herb you could use alongside or instead of sage. Thyme tastes like a minty or lemon-esque cousin of sage. Fresh thyme will have a cleaner, brighter taste than dried thyme, but can pair beautifully and uplift your meal. This might surprise you, but you can absolutely make this breakfast recipe without using actual meat. Many popular vegan options do come in patty or link form, but you can break them up before cooking or use a meat chopper as you brown them in a skillet. To make the sauce entirely vegan-friendly, skip the whole milk and use unsweetened and unflavored plant-based milk. In our opinion, hemp, macadamia, and pea milk have the least amount of natural sweetness for baking. If you need more fat content in the roux, use vegetable or olive oil in place of butter. You can even make vegan biscuits by using some helpful tips and recommendations for vegan baking substitutions. Don't feel like making biscuits from scratch? Try your homemade vegan sausage gravy on breakfast potatoes or hash browns instead. Come on, rabbit. You can do it. Oh, rabbit, he's killing you. If one of the biggest challenges you face each morning is deciding between a sweet or savory breakfast, we've got you covered. Adding a bit of real maple syrup to your sausage gravy recipe adds the slight saccharin profile you crave to a hearty and savory meal. We recommend always choosing real maple syrup over a maple-flavored option, because the real version will lend a mellow maple taste without being overly sugary or sweet. What is the best way to tell real versus fake maple syrup flavored bottles? Read the ingredients. Look for pure maple syrup as the one and only ingredient on the list, and this will help you avoid the sticky substitutes. You'll also have to remember to store your syrup in the refrigerator to avoid the growth of mold and bacteria. Plastic containers do allow air in, so storing maple syrup in a glass or tin container can keep it fresh and spoil-free for up to a year, according to the USDA. Using garlic powder adds a mild piquant flavor to any dish. It is a convenient and long-lasting ingredient that gives dishes a garlicky essence without any peeling or chopping. Fresh garlic can become overpowering in recipes and has a pretty assertive flavor. Adding this allium in powder form softens the taste and allows other ingredients to shine. If you do happen to have some fresh garlic that is teetering on the not-so-fresh-anymore fence, try dehydrating it in the oven and make your own garlic powder at home to use in your next batch of breakfast gravy. How do you know how much garlic powder to use in your recipe? Spiceography notes that one clove of fresh garlic is equal to about one-eighth of a teaspoon of garlic powder. We recommend no more than a fourth of a teaspoon in a batch of sausage gravy. Normally an ingredient added to seasonal baked goods, nutmeg adds a nutty warmth to bechamel-based sauces that other spices and ingredients can't quite reproduce. And its particular softness pairs perfectly with bow sausage and silky gravy. Nutmeg comes as a whole seed that can be grated into a meal, or you can buy it already ground into a powder form. When using it in a cream sauce, a little goes a very long way. This is especially true if you're grating it directly into the food. Freshly grated nutmeg has a higher potency, and you'll get the unique flavor by using very little. When adding ground nutmeg to this dish, an eighth of a teaspoon is plenty. If you do find yourself with a whole nutmeg seed, you can also use it to elevate your mashed potatoes or sprinkle it into a bechamel for an ingredient that will change your lasagna forever. Worcestershire sauce is a fermented fish sauce that lends a briny yet sweet and acidic taste to any meal. Sausage gravy is no exception, and this early morning meal pairs well with all of the complex flavors found in this well-known multi-use condiment. Some home cooks don't realize that the surprising ingredient in Worcestershire sauce is anchovies. The little fish are fermented for 18 months and are what give the sauce its unique salty taste. Along with anchovies, you'll find molasses, salt, vinegar, tamarind, and a few other flavor-packed elements. Leave your hungry breakfast guests wondering what that perfect undertone of flavors could be.
You got, you got three lemons. What my baby wants, my baby gets. You know that. No, but I, I wanted 12. Baby wanted 12. Sausage gravy is not a light food. It is rich and it's hearty and can be quite heavy as a breakfast meal. Using acid to cut through some of the richness of a cream sauce is a great way to lighten up the taste. Lemon juice adds brightness and depth of flavor to a luscious blonde gravy by allowing you to taste more than just fat and dairy. Fresh lemon is key here. Using bottled lemon juice can add an off-putting, artificial, or sour taste to your food. Adding a squeeze of fresh lemon, no more than two tablespoons, will elevate the taste of your gravy and help the flavors of the meat and herbs shine through. You can also try this lemon juice trick in your favorite chicken fettuccine recipe, or even to spice up your jarred alfredo. Onions improve the taste and add a zesty savoriness to almost any dish they are used in. While you can experiment and try cooking with every type of onion, yellow onion is a match made in heaven for this decadent breakfast recipe. Also known as the Spanish onion, yellow onions are a go-to for most recipes that call for alliums and are ideal for sautéing and caramelizing. They have a great depth of flavor, and when cooking onions, yellows offer a light and sweet taste that provide more mild acidity to balance your creamy breakfast staple. Be sure to chop them finely. We suggest mincing and cook them low and slow for quite a while to caramelize them and bring out their sweetness. Add them to your protein just before it finishes browning to punch up the flavor of your sausage gravy. Hatch chiles are a variety of pepper that is commonly found in the Southwest and Midwest. They are drier in taste than bell peppers, and these unique regional chiles offer a balance of mild spiciness, sweetness, and a slight sharp bite to a dish. Hatch chiles can be found raw in many grocery stores, but it is easiest to find them diced and packed into affordable cans. Hatch chiles also have an earthier taste than some of their other chili pepper counterparts. This could explain why they pair so well with savory powerhouses like sage and thyme, and are featured in many sausage varieties and sauces. To use hatch chilies in this dish, dice them up finely, as you would an onion, and cook them right along with your protein before starting the roux. You could also roast them prior to adding them to your dish, which brings out the rich, smoky notes that are waiting to be expressed from the chili. There's an abundance of reasons you should keep cayenne pepper in your pantry, and sausage gravy is one of them. Kick up the warmth in your breakfast sauce by adding a dash of heavy lifting heat. This spicy powder is made from whole cayenne peppers, which register 30,000 to 50,000 Scoville units, compared to the jalapenos, which hits 5,000 units, according to scovillescale.org. A few pinches of cayenne pepper will add some serious intensity. Cayenne pepper is also the base of many hot sauces, and you can absolutely add a few shakes of your favorite spicy condiment into this breakfast dish in place of cayenne pepper. The best hot sauce brands will have heat and acidity that blends beautifully with sausage gravy rather than standing out as an independent addition. While we are all about getting creative and experimenting with ingredients, you will likely find a more successful pairing with Mexican or American-style hot sauces for this breakfast dish rather than sauces with Thai-inspired flavors. If you want to boost the taste of your dish but are a bit more heat-averse, try using paprika instead of cayenne pepper. Paprika imbues notes of zinging warmth without being inherently pungent. Rotel tomatoes add the perfect amount of acidity and just the right bit of zestiness to this classic breakfast recipe. Tomatoes offer an excellent addition of acid to rich and creamy dishes, while also bringing an inherent tanginess, too. And the chilies included in each can of Rotel add a spicy and bold taste. We really could not ask for a better pairing for our early morning meal. Rotel offers a variety of options to upgrade your sausage gravy. Choose from original, mild, or if you're a spice-seeking food lover, go for a can of the hot. Rotel's fire-roasted version erupts out in smokiness and rolls a unique unique flavor throughout your gravy. We love serving this Rotel-infused sausage gravy over a plate of scrambled eggs or on a bowl of cheesy grits. Thanks, Bacon Bits and Chicken Skin. Known for making just about anything extra tasty, what makes these ingredients such good additions to deviled eggs? Deviled eggs, aka hard-boiled eggs with the yolks mashed into a creamy paste, are a common selection amid any spread of finger foods and snacks at a party. But as with all dishes, they can be prone to simple mistakes. These range from overcooking the eggs to creating flavorless, lumpy yolk mixtures, notes HuffPost. Fortunately, deviled eggs that turn out less than stellar can be fixed with toppings. Depending on your taste, according to the Neelys, deviled eggs can be smoky, savory, hot, or even fried. With most deviled eggs, you expect them to be relatively smooth, from the tender egg to the creamy yolk filling. A good topping provides extra flavor and some much-needed texture. That's where bacon bits come in. Finally, some good as Real Simple explains, the addition of bacon bits provides a smoky flavor and crispy texture to the otherwise smooth and neutral flavored eggs. 
To amplify the bacon flavor, James Beard suggests using fried pork belly in lieu of bacon, which will give it a much bolder texture. One can also follow Chef Daryl Smith's avenue for amplifying deviled eggs by loading them with black-eyed peas and pork chops for a meatier, more complex flavor. Other ways you can add textures and flavors to your eggs can include lobster, Chick-fil-A sauce, and even potato chips if you're following Emeril Lagasse's deviled eggs recipe. As long as you have a lot of eggs, the sky's the limit. Then there's truffles. This one probably costs 300 This is $300. Yeah. Cheaper than a diamond, for sure. Wow. Truffles aren't as common or affordable as your average pack of bacon. They are more of a delicacy. A single jar of black truffles can cost as much as $30 on Amazon. But should you have an event coming up where you want your deviled eggs to stand out, adding a bit of truffle may not be a bad idea. Anne Burrell's deviled eggs recipe details how to use truffles in deviled eggs, using both the oil and truffle itself. Burrell's recipe includes mixing the yolks of a hard-boiled egg, mayonnaise, truffle oil, and cayenne into a creamy filling before piping into the egg whites and topping off with chopped truffles and chives. While truffles aren't as easy to find as bacon, their addition adds a rich flavor to a typically common, simple dish, but an even more savory potential deviled egg flavor awaits. When you think of chicken skin, you likely think of greasy, somewhat soggy, and chewy brown skin that gets in the way of all that juicy, tender meat. While that may be true, chicken skin can also be a flavorful, crisp garnish for deviled eggs. As the local palate details, preparing fried chicken skin isn't too complex. All you need to do is remove the skin from the bird, making sure that you remove as much fat as you can from the skin while you do so. Place the skins in a pot with water, onion, garlic, and bay leaves, and boil the water until at medium-high heat before killing the heat and letting them sit for 15 minutes. Next, drain and dry the skins while preparing your fry coating of flour, cornmeal, breadcrumbs, and seasonings. Once the chicken skins are cool, dredge them in the fry coating and fry them up. If you're worried about the taste of chicken skin, Esquire describes it as being similar to bacon in terms of mouthfeel, and it's been a part of Jewish cooking for many years. Consider it a crispier version of fried chicken that will provide a salty, crunchy, and southern-style flavor to your deviled eggs. From cleaning your grill to making a cheesy keto treat, there's more to onions than meets the eye. Time to peel back the layers and reveal the incredible inner potential of this humble bulb. If you've ever eaten an onion ring, and why on earth would you not have? Then you'll know how frustrating it is when the crumbs come away from the onion. Instead of that perfect bite that's crispy on the outside and soft on the inside, you'll get a mouthful of crumbs. You can also end up with a piece of onion hanging free that can taste a bit wet, too. Yeah. But fear not, for there's a nifty hack that solves this small yet common problem. And since onion rings are hugely popular, you may end up using this tip posted on TikTok time and time again. Freeze the onion after it's cut into rings, then defrost by running under warm water. Next, remove the thin membrane on the inside of the ring. So it's important to note that by freezing and defrosting your onion, you're going to lose some of the characteristic pungency of the onion. So if you're a big fan of that, you may not like this hack. When the onion rings are breaded, the coating won't slide off. One comment suggests you can remove this layer by soaking the rings in iced water, while another suggests it'll come off underwater without freezing first. It really depends on how much effort you're prepared to put into a hack, even if it does make chowing down on onion rings that much more appetizing. Did someone say cheesy onion rings? That's right, and if you're following the keto diet or trying to cut down on carbs, then this creative hack is for you. Even if you're not, the idea of onion rings made with cheese is too tempting not to try, especially if you want to enjoy the crunch of a freshly cooked onion ring without breadcrumbs or batter. These onion rings look more like onion waffles, and that's because they're made using a mini waffle iron. You'll need to spray the hot surface of your waffle maker with oil and add some cheese. It's up to you what you choose, but mozzarella works well. As the cheese starts to melt, add in sections of the onion ring, laying them next to each other to fill the circle of cheese. Sprinkle on garlic powder and top with more cheese. Close the lid and cook for a few minutes. Before removing your onion ring waffle and letting it cool and soak up any excess oil on a paper towel, it's now ready to bite into and enjoy that satisfying onion ring crunch.
When you get grilling, do you really go for it and sizzle lots of marinated meats? Or perhaps load up on some plant-based barbecue recipes? After a while, your grill can get a bit clogged with stuck-on ingredients. This means that fresh food you might add get burnt bits sticking to it, or even the taste of whatever you've cooked up before. And you're just not going to get that fresh taste if your cooking surface isn't clean. That's why you'll want to keep a few raw onions handy for your next cookout. Why? Well, you'll need them to rub the grates on your grill with half an onion that's been peeled. You first let your grill heat up so the temperature is pretty high. Stab your half onion on the rounded part so it's firmly stuck on the end of a fork. Rub the cut side along the grill. The juices will steam up, helping get rid of any burnt-on food on the grates. As well as cleaning a grill with an onion, cook another onion on the grill. Cut round slices of onion, marinade, and spear with a metal skewer, adding a few to one prong. Flip to cook on both sides until they're lovely and caramelized. Unless you particularly enjoy biting into a whole raw onion, you're more than likely going to cut it down to size in one way or another. Most recipes are quite specific about what size pieces your onion should be and how to cook them. A lot of the time you're required to dice an onion, and with this vegetable appearing in so many dishes, it's a good idea to have a chopping technique that works. If you find that you're slipping around with slices all over the board as you try and cut into them, then a viral TikTok hack on how to dice onions more easily could resonate. Chop the tip of an onion so that it's flat on the bottom and it sits up on your chopping board vertically. Make sure to peel it first, unless you enjoy the taste of the papery outer skin of onions in your food. And unless you use your tears to season the onions, Whatever you do, don't cut off the end with the root. In centimeter gaps, make cuts from the core at the top downward through the curved sides of the onion, creating segments like an orange. Turn the onion onto its side and slide downward, so you're in effect cutting across the onion. As you slice, diced onion pieces will fall down onto the board. It's always fun when there's more than one hack to tackle the same issue. It means you can try them all and find out which one works best for you. So if you're on a quest to stop blubbering every time you want to make some homemade baked onion rings, you might want to grab a few sheets of kitchen towels before you start cutting your onion. One of the best ways to avoid crying while cutting onions is to use a sharp knife. The reason being is that the membranes within the cells of the vegetable are less broken down. As a result, less of the pungent gas can escape. Aside from this, it's suggested that you wear a damp paper towel around your neck at the front to stop the released gases from reaching your eyes and nose. Or you could take some advice from this viral TikTok that states that the acid in onions is attracted to the nearest water source, which is often your tear ducts. So how do you prevent that from happening? Get a damp paper towel, fold it up, keep it on your cutting board. That acid will be drawn to the wet paper towel and not your tear ducts. You know how it goes. You add onion to a recipe, only to find that you've got a whole bag full of these bulbs and you're not quite sure how to get through them. There are only so many onion-based recipes after all, and even those often don't call for lots of bulbs. For example, caramelized onion hummus only uses one large onion. If you're a fan of sharp, tangy, vinegary taste, then why not put your onions into a jar and pickle them? Here's what you'll need to do. Thinly slice the red onion and cover it with a marinade. The marinade is a simple concoction of apple cider vinegar, sugar, and salt. You can also add some herbs in there too if you like. It's really up to you. For every red onion used, marinate it in a half a cup of vinegar with a teaspoon of sugar and one and a half teaspoons of kosher salt. Refrigerate with the onion slices covered completely. While you could dig in after just 10 minutes, you really want to leave the jar for at least an hour, if not overnight or longer. They'll turn a lovely pink color as they pickle, making a tart topping for a tuna fish sandwich or a sweet sour condiment served with tacos. So, you've cut the ends off your onion and yanked the peel off and another layer or two of onion has come away with that. The vegetable that's ready for chopping on your board suddenly looks a lot smaller than it once did. According to one TikToker, too many people are guilty of unnecessarily wasting too much of their bulbs. So with that, let's not waste any more onions. The post focuses on the misguided way people are often taught to cut onions. Cut off the root end, cut off the bottom, put it down, and now cut it in half. I'm sorry, but wasteful and wrong. The issue is that there's quite a bit of onion on these cut ends, which are generally discarded. The right way, apparently, is to not cut either end and cut lengthways from each end down the middle. At the tip end, cut off a small amount so you're just getting rid of the ends of the skin. You don't need to take the other end off, as this is the tear-inducing root, and it's simply not necessary unless you're julianine. 
You may want a good technique to dice an onion so you can do it quickly and avoid shedding too many tears, or fingernails for that matter. Or perhaps you love onions so much that you're using them all the time and need an effective way to chop them. Maybe you just want to improve your kitchen knife skills. Peel your onion and cut off the tip, leaving the root intact. Cut in half lengthways and place the cut side down on your chopping board. Make several cuts from one end to the other, not including the root. Now chop across and you'll have diced onion pieces. Celebrity chef Rachel Ray also dices this way. Her advice is to remember which end to cut off and which to keep. Imagine that you're leaving the hair on the onion, as this hairy end is where the root is, and this shouldn't be cut into. She also comments how there's no need to cut across the onion as it's already separated naturally into layers. Making this particular chopping tip is the most… Logical. Sometimes there are those ideas that, while making sense, seem to come from left field and are loved because of their ingenuity much like this technique to easily peel onions that was posted on TikTok. But first, you'll need to grab a mallet. I'm getting me mallet! Excellent! Now, put a whole onion into a Ziploc bag and then put this into a larger Ziploc bag, making sure not to seal either of the two bags. Now it's time to make like the Hulk and… Smash. Bash them hard with a meat mallet several times, hitting the onion hard. Reach in and pull the skin out, which should be in big pieces. Tip out the contents of the bags and you should have a pile of peeled, chopped up onion, with no knife needed and no watery eyes. Do you know when somebody does something when they're cooking as if it's second nature and you literally feel a duh moment because it makes so much sense? You just can't believe how you couldn't have thought of it. But because culinary wizards like Bobby Flay have already done it, you don't need to. If you've ever grilled onions on a barbecue, then this hack posted on the TV channel's Instagram page is for you. You don't need anything extra to try this, just some red onions. Cut fairly chunky slices of red onion so that each slice is round and the layers aren't separated. The key is to not peel your onion. Grilling slices with the skin on them helps to keep the slices in one circular piece on the grill. That means it's easier to flip and remove them from the grill when they're finished cooking. You won't get any onion pieces falling through the grate into the coals either. Don't expect to simply shake a bag of onions and they're magically peeled. If only kitchen life was so simple. Although you're not too far off if you've tried this clever technique demonstrated on TikTok. However, you will need a knife to make a cut or two to your onions first. You didn't think it would be that easy, did you? Cut both ends of each onion off while they still have the skin on. So you are basically topping and tailing them. Put the onions in an empty saucepan, adding a few at a time. Put the lid on and… Holding it securely, shake the pan for a few seconds. When you put the pot down and look inside, you should find that your onion skins have magically peeled away. The good news is that you now don't have to pick away at the peel and break it off in pieces, which can take a lot longer to do and is also sometimes a bit fiddly. Is your celery a stringy, bitter disappointment or as floppy as a wet noodle? If so, keep watching to learn a few simple tricks to beat the bitterness and crisp up your stalks. Whether you're whipping up a tuna salad, putting together a crudité platter, or crafting your go-to stuffing recipe, celery is a staple in many kitchens. It adds a unique herb-like flavor and a whole lot of crunch. However, for many individuals, there's one issue preventing them from loving this particular vegetable, the stringy texture of celery exterior. In a Reddit thread from several years ago, one user made the simple suggestion of removing the exterior strings before eating, and the post racked up 361 comments. Some Reddit users commented about what a silly extra step it was. Raw celery has what are called calinkama cells on the exterior, which are responsible for helping give the produce its customary crunch. These water-filled cells are also the reason behind that stringy texture, though. Yet, while it adds an extra step to your prep process, there's a special hack to get rid of that stringy exterior in order to whip up the celery dish of your dreams. While you might not consider celery to be a vegetable with a peel, a vegetable peeler is the easiest way to get rid of those strings, particularly on the outer stalks, which tend to be a bit tougher. This effectively removes those stringy portions and you're left with crunchy, string-free celery to enjoy in whatever dish you're making. Or you could use a sharp paring knife to peel away that exterior portion of your celery. If the peeling process sounds too time-consuming, there's another method we recommend you try. Grab the base of the celery stalk you're looking to de-string. Snap it, and you should be able to simply pull the thick threads away from the stalk. 
Is all this additional prep work just too much for you to handle? Are you getting exhausted by just the thought of peeling celery? I'm tired of this, Grandpa! That's too damn bad! It's just the price you pay for the best celery of your life. But if you really can't be bothered to add an extra step to your celery prep, we suggest you go for just those tender inner ribs. They may be too stringy for true celery haters, but they are much different in texture and flavor than the exterior stalks. In addition to the unappealing texture of the stringy portions, another key factor that causes celery haters to avoid the vegetable is its bitterness. Luckily, there are a few ways to help temper the vegetable's natural bitterness. It all depends on how you need to use the celery in your dish, starting from the point of purchase. While you may normally be drawn toward the most vibrant, colorful produce possible, as that's typically a visual indicator of ripeness, you want to go in the opposite direction for celery. Deeper green stalks are a strong indicator that the celery will be on the bitter side. This is because they haven't been bleached in the sunlight. Bleaching helps to combat processes that encourage that color and consequent bitterness to develop. If you're trying to rescue celery that you've already purchased, there are a few things to consider. You're in luck if your dish requires the celery to be cooked, because this will help reduce those bitter flavor notes while highlighting some of the more aromatic, pleasant flavor notes within celery. With any preparation, you can also incorporate seasonings designed to counteract the bitterness. Salty and fatty flavors can counteract the bitterness, so you may consider pairing your celery with some strategic flavors. If you're a celery lover unbothered by its stringiness or bitterness, there is one hurdle that you may face. Reaching into your refrigerator to pull out celery only to find that it's become limp seemingly overnight. Don't immediately toss it out though, it can typically be revived. An easy way to bring limp celery back to life is to cut off a small portion of the stalks in order to expose more of the interior. Then stand the celery in a jar or container with cold water for an hour or so. This tip works because the cells in those submerged celery stalks will absorb the cold water, firming up the stalks again. You can also try wrapping the celery loosely in aluminum foil. This will help keep it from becoming dry and limp. Alternatively, you can cut the stalks into smaller pieces and store those in water from the moment you bring the produce home. Of course, if your celery is limp, it just means you don't want to use it in dishes where you need that crunchy texture. Instead, consider incorporating it in something like a soup or stir-fry, where it'll soften during the cooking process anyway. Shots, sorbet, and somehow pizza. What? Here's how to up your watermelon game on a hot summer day. Perfect for hot summer days, watermelon ice cubes and popsicles aren't just refreshing, but also remarkably easy to make. For ice cubes, all you have to do is chop up your watermelon into bite-sized pieces and pop them in the freezer. No ice cube tray is required. Just grab a knife and you're good to go. Almost as easy to make as watermelon ice cubes, watermelon popsicles make a healthy and invigorating summer tree. Simply puree your ingredients and pour them into popsicle molds. While watermelon popsicle recipes vary, they obviously share a common base, fresh, juicy watermelon. You can make your own adult watermelon popsicles by blending watermelon with fresh mint, fresh lime juice, agave syrup, and tequila blanco. For a sweeter take on the cooling treat, you can also try adding honey and strawberries to the mix. While it might be tempting to purchase cubed watermelon at the supermarket, buying pre-cut fruit isn't recommended. Not only do pre-cut watermelons go bad faster, but they can be a breeding ground for dangerous microorganisms. The best way to enjoy this vibrantly colored fruit is by buying it whole and cutting it at home yourself. While most of us usually cut watermelons into wedges or slices, there's a much more convenient way to enjoy this sweet treat, slicing it into sticks. To begin, cut the watermelon in half lengthwise. Next, place one of the halves on a cutting board with the flat side facing down. With a sharp knife, cut the fruit into one inch slices, and then cut it in the opposite direction to create nice long rectangles. One option is to keep the watermelon rind to make the sticks easier to handle and eat. Alternatively, you can take a slightly different approach by removing the watermelon rind before slicing the fruit into sticks. Once cut, cover the watermelon with a bowl and flip over the cutting board to transfer it into the dish. Finally, place skewers into each watermelon stick et voila! A delicious array of mess-free treats. The allure of watermelon jello shots lies both in their taste and visual appeal. 
Unlike conventional Jello shots, watermelon Jello shots take the form of mini wedges. What's even better, making these delightful adult treats requires just five simple ingredients: watermelon, water, watermelon-flavored Jello, and a splash of vodka or another spirit. Of course, you can also make them virgin if you so choose. Whipping your Jello shots into shape is as simple as cutting the watermelon into two halves, scooping out its flesh, and using the hollowed rind containers to set the Jello. Once ready, the Jello bowls can be cut into one-inch slices and then two or three separate wedges. You've got to admit, they don't look half bad, do they? Pizza time. Watermelon pizza offers an imaginative and refreshing take on a classic dish. The light, low-calorie nature of this recipe makes it perfect as an appetizer or a snack between meals. As creative as the person who makes it, watermelon pizza can also be customized with a plethora of sweet and savory ingredients, from fruit and herbs to cheeses. To make watermelon pizza, slice the fruit in half and then cut it into one-inch thick circles before topping them with your chosen ingredients. Once ready, cut the watermelon pizza into slices just like you would a regular pizza. If you aren't sure what goes well with watermelon, some popular recommendations include cilantro, jicama, tomatoes, ricotta, goat cheese, and fennel. Alternatively, you can use colorful fruit such as strawberries, kiwis, raspberries, and blueberries to create a dish that's not just delicious but also visually appealing. If you're serving watermelon pizza as dessert, you can also top it with whipped cream or chocolate sauce. Watermelons make a great alternative to traditional punch bowls, guaranteeing a crowd-pleasing addition to any party. Blending creativity and functionality, watermelon kegs provide a convenient method for dispensing drinks, and you can also infuse them with a refreshing hint of watermelon flavor. Whether it's a fruity punch, an aromatic cocktail, or a refreshing non-alcoholic concoction, a watermelon beverage dispenser is bound to make for the perfect icebreaker. To turn a watermelon into a drink dispenser, cut a slice off the bottom end of the fruit to create Create a stable base, then remove a larger slice from the top of the melon to form a lid-like opening. Next, scoop out the fruit's innards just like you would with a pumpkin for Halloween. Once the watermelon is hollow, use a drill or an apple corer to make a hole for the spigot. Take care not to crack the fruit's rind when pushing the spigot into place. If you don't have a new spigot and don't fancy a trip to the hardware store, you can try repurposing an old beer keg tap or a water dispenser tap to save time. It may come as a surprise to some foodies, but grilling watermelon actually enhances its unique flavors and texture. This is because heat caramelizes the fruit's sugars, bringing out its sweetness. Searing watermelon also imbues it with smoky and earthy tones. Grilling watermelon also makes it firmer and chewier without compromising the fruit's trademark juiciness. Some have even gone as far as comparing the consistency to that of meat. To make grilled watermelon, slice it into half-inch wedges, leaving the rind intact. Next, line the pieces of fruit on a sizzling griddle or grill and sear for between two and three minutes or until you see grill marks. Le grill? What the hell is that? Grilled watermelon can be enjoyed on its own as a refreshing appetizer or side dish or as an unexpected addition to salads and desserts. Smooth and velvety in texture, sorbet is a light alternative to ice cream. Most sorbets are also vegan, dairy-free, and paleo, which makes the frozen treat perfect for anyone on dietary restrictions. Although you'll find an endless range of flavor options for sorbet, watermelon is one of the best ingredients due to its refreshing flavor and 92% water content. That being said, it's best to use seedless watermelon when making sorbet, since the last thing you need is any unwelcome visitors in your dessert. While watermelon sorbet is relatively simple to make, it does require a little forethought, since you need to cut and freeze the fruit before starting the preparation process. To make things easy, simply pop the watermelon and any other fruits you like in the freezer the night before. If you're looking to add a touch of creaminess to the mix, bananas are a great option too. The next day, puree the fruit along with some water, lime juice, and maple syrup or honey before popping the mixture in the freezer for another 12 hours. To get the texture of the sorbet exactly right, it's best to add the water gradually as you blend the ingredients. For many of us, watermelon seeds are nothing but a nuisance. For others, they represent a world of possibilities. With each fruit harboring between 300 and 500 seeds, the potential for creativity is vast. To obtain the best seeds possible, it's best to use a watermelon that has been allowed to fully ripen on the vine or even become overly ripe, since watermelon seeds stop ripening the second the fruit is cut down. Once in the kitchen, scoop the watermelon flesh out and place it in a container with water. The pulp and damaged seeds will float while the healthy seeds will sink to the bottom, aiding in the separation process. If you're using a colander to separate watermelon seeds from the flesh, be mindful of the fact that it's the melon's black seeds that are ready to eat. 
while their white counterparts are still unripe. To make the seeds ready for consumption, dry them in the sun for around a week or save time by roasting them in the oven. Whatever method you choose, rest assured that the final result will be both tasty and nutritious since watermelon seeds contain plenty of magnesium, potassium, and fatty acids. According to the National Watermelon Promotion Board, which, yes, is a real thing, a staggering 40% of us have no idea that watermelon rind is edible. Even those of us with an inkling that watermelon skin can be repurposed typically discard it, unaware of its versatility in the kitchen and its many health benefits. According to Healthline, incorporating watermelon rind in your diet can lower blood pressure, add fiber to your diet, and increase oxygen delivery to the muscles. Scientists believe that the first human being who will live 150 years has already been born. I believe I am that human being. Watermelon rind can be utilized in a multitude of ways. It makes a delicious addition to stir fries since it's quick to soften and takes on the flavors of the sauce. It can also be pickled for a tart and crunchy treat. Notably, the first cookbook published in the U.S. all the way back in 1796 included a recipe for pickled watermelon rind, alongside other treats such as stuffed goose and queen's cake. Other ways to make the most out of watermelon rind is by turning it into smoothies or shredding it on salads. For a sweet treat, you can also transform watermelon rind into candy. Start by cutting the rind into one-inch chunks and then boil the pieces until they are tender and translucent. Finally, add sugar and lemon juice to the mix and simmer on medium heat. Once they have cooled, store the watermelon rind candy in airtight containers. Rather than popping them in the fridge, however, it's best to place the containers in a cool and dry place to prevent the rinds from getting sticky. When life gives you lemons, make lemonade, Franklin. Do you have any lemonade? No, sir. As you're probably well aware, lemonade contains lemons, sugar, and water. However, this sweet beverage isn't limited to these three ingredients. Lemonade has countless variations that incorporate additional flavors, fruits, and even herbs to create unique and refreshing drink combinations. One such additional ingredient is watermelon, which boasts a sweetness that acts as a great complement to the tangy taste of lemons. To make your own watermelon lemonade, chill the fruit in the fridge, scoop out its flesh, and puree it in a blender before straining. Then Combine the watermelon juice with cold water, lemon juice, sugar, fresh mint, and crushed ice. For extra flair, garnish the concoction with a slice of lime. An ideal thirst quencher on hot summer evenings, watermelon lemonade is also healthy. In addition to the vitamin C found in lemons, watermelon is a rich source of vitamin A, carotenoids, and lycopene. The classic salsa recipe we all know and love features a predictable list of ingredients, including tomatoes, onion, garlic, lime, and dried chili peppers. There are plenty of more unusual salsa versions out there, though, and believe it or not, salsa doesn't need to be savory. This versatile condiment is also often loaded with fruit, berries, and other sweet ingredients. Those looking for a fresh take on the ubiquitous dish could even give watermelon a go. Ideal for serving with tortilla chips or as a taco topping, watermelon salsa can be as varied as each foodie. Whatever you add to it, with watermelon as a base, the dish is bound to be incredibly refreshing and come with a welcome tinge of sweetness. Popular takes on the dish combine watermelon with ingredients such as cherry tomatoes, serrano peppers, red onion, fresh mint, fresh cilantro, lime, as well as salt and pepper. If you think skewers need to be meaty, think again. There are plenty of satisfying skewer options out there that don't include meat. Particularly popular on hot days, watermelon skewers make a juicy and colorful treat that's not just light and delicious, but also invigorating and hydrating. Watermelon skewers are versatile and easy to prepare. Simply cut the watermelon into cubes and skewer them with a bunch of other ingredients, depending on the season and your mood. Watermelon skewers can even be turned into imaginative drink markers and food holders. Ideal for kids' parties, the skewers can be made with a variety of melons and berries to add color to the end result. To make the job easy, use cookie cutters to fashion your ingredients into the desired shapes before placing them on the skewers.